Um, so this is a workshop on knowing, and I'm going to teach you about subsidiary focal integration, and I'm going to teach you about covenant epistemology, and I'm going to make you learn subsidiary focal integration. So that's going to be kind of key and uh, we'll start to get going on how knowing actually works. And I'm gonna say this is what you've been doing since childhood, it's what you're already doing. It's just that what has happened in um, modernity is the accents have been mislaid <laughs> on what it is that we're actually doing. So we've actually been blinded to uh, what we do and do well as human persons. So, and I really feel that uh, in what I'm gonna say to you, um, we're gonna get to see how meaning means, uh, at least in a, in a small way. So, um, this little guy is, I, I call him Mel, for Pell-Mel. Uh, he's from this book by Robert McCloskey, uh, Make Way for Ducklings. I just love McCloskey's pencil drawings. And so, uh, this guy is about to run over the, the mother and daddy duck, but I cut them off of my picture. <laughs> So uh, let's start with uh, talking about some examples of knowing. And um, I'm going to tell you the story of the Copperhead as it's told in Longing to Know. So uh, my girls, including Stacy's, my, my middle daughter, and she was, how old were, were you when we moved to that house? 10? All right, let's say 10. So the girls were 8, 10, and 12. And um, we moved to a house that bordered on uh, the woods. And uh, I loved the idea of my children being able to play in the woods, so I sent them out the door to play in the woods, and they came running back in saying, Mommy, Mommy, come see, come look. And so uh, I went out to see what they had discovered in the woods, and they said, Look! And I saw nothing. <laughs> so um, I looked further, and they were not telling me what it was I was supposed to be seeing. But we had been uh, recently to, um, a little friend's birthday party at the Nature Center and the guide had explained that in the state of Missouri there were two poisonous snakes and one of them, the better known one, is the copperhead. And uh, you can pick him out by the beautiful set of Hershey Kisses in the patterns on his back. You know what Hershey Kisses are, the, can the candy. So um, as I was staring at this uh, leafy floor in the woods, I suddenly saw the Hershey Kisses and my life changed. <laughs> and all of a sudden there was this switcheroo and that copperhead was in charge of the situation and I was reaching for my girls and falling back and ready to run and get away from him. And there he was just sitting there looking at me. And by the way, practically every state I've lived in, there's another copperhead story. So I have multiple copperhead stories, not just in Missouri. Anyway, I would suggest that any act of perception is going to involve the kind of knowing that um, I'm going to talk about here. So you've got this figure that pops out from a ground, right? And then reality shifts. I'm going to talk to you about skills, and I'm going to ask you to talk about your skills and your perceptions too. But um, here's what happened when Daddy wanted to teach me to learn to ride a bike. So um, uh, there, I didn't have a bike. He borrowed a bike. It was too big for me. He did not believe in training wheels. Uh, he was quite confident that I could do this. He took me to the back of our yard at the top of the grassy hill. He put me on that contraption, and he pushed me. And then he yelled, balance! <laughs> Oh dear, did I say I was a skeptic? Okay, so I was sure no human being could balance on two points. And, and uh, you know, what I, I remember being conscious that I had no idea what the word balance meant. You know, it just was crazy. And uh, I'm sure he had this idea that by the end of the hill I'd be riding. I have no recollection of the bottom of the hill. <laughs> However, I am a bike rider. So somewhere along the line, there was some kind of a switch from uh, all these, these pieces that were just not working out for me. So the words were meaningless, the world was scary, and uh, the bike was a contraption that was meaningless, and my body was meaningless too. It was opaque, and I had no idea what it was I was supposed to do. Well, so uh, 
This adolescent skeptic eventually around uh, or in my early 20s found the work of this Hungarian premier scientist turned philosopher who writes a book called Personal Knowledge. It's his Gifford lectures in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, Michael Polanyi was a famous scientific discoverer in conversation with Albert Einstein and other greats at the beginning of the 20th century. Discovery was his job. And discovery, as far as he was concerned, was the main act in knowing which is not collecting information, but it's moving from uh, the unknown to knowing. So how does one do that? And he argues in personal knowledge, if knowledge is explicit information, no scientific discovery could ever happen. But it does. <laughs> so maybe we need a different model of what's going on when we know. And so, in a way, he stepped away from science to save science to help scientists see what they were actually doing that was working out for them in knowing. And he's the one that proposes this idea that all knowing is subsidiary focal integration. It might be on page 43 <laughs> in personal knowledge. Okay, now I'm the one who's always trying to, to uh, translate so that this is for everybody in the street. So here's uh, one rendition of subsidiary focal integration, and these are the part headings in my book, Longing to Know. So, knowing is the profoundly human struggle to rely on clues, to focus on a pattern which we submit to as a token of reality. I'm going to get you on board with that today so that for the rest of your life, this will haunt you and you'll see it everywhere because it's everywhere. Okay, so this is also, by the way, uh, not just the act of coming to know, this is the creative act as well, because these two are of a piece with each other. So, ready? Here we go. So here's some in introductory things to get you on board with subsidiary focal integration. I get all this part from Michael Polanyi, and he said that all knowing has a from to structure subsidiary, focal, and it's not additive, it's integrative, subsidiary, focal, integration. Every skill is this, every perception is this. We attend to some things, but we attend from some other things, from, to. And the things that we're attending from, we're relying on, we're not focusing on. And the subsidiary here is, is really, really key to helping us torpedo the daisy, okay? So subsidiary is a word that means it relies on something else, or it, it uh, points towards something else, or it supports something else. So uh, subsidiary awareness. Uh, it's, the subsidiary awareness is nearer to us, it's proximal, whereas the thing we're focusing on is farther away. And the other cool thing that's going on, and this is Polanyi's word, in, we're indwelling what he's going to call clues. So these subsidiaries, we can't specify in the act, we can't even specify what they are, but somehow we're indwelling them uh, in a bodied way. We're putting our trust in them to open up and invite a farther reality. So from, to, attend from, attend to, rely on, focus on, subsidiary, focal, proximal, distal, and then uh, this idea, this felt indwelling. And then the point is, you might be articulating uh, where it is you're going, especially once you have the aha moment, but all the things that you're relying on, in your relying on them, are unspecifiable, okay? So along the way, so this might be halfway between point A and point B, <laughs> uh, there's kind of a switcheroo, a transformation. So you switch from looking at to looking from the subsidiaries. So at the top of the hill, you know, my, my father's words were meaningless. The bike was opaque, my body was opaque, the situation was scary, 
They didn't connect with each other. But there comes this transformation where you come to this place where you can say, oh, I'm riding. Or, oh, I see it. I see the copperhead. And at that moment, you have this act of integration that puts these all together and connects them with your body. And the actual pattern, the moment of insight, transforms everything that you were trying to make sense of in your scrabbling toward it. So integration, the pattern, transforms the clues. Uh, we all talk about epiphanies, having epiphanies or moments of insight, eureka moments. Well, Polanyi was saying that is not a, a throwaway phrase. That's the heart of knowing right there. So you need to see that the moment of insight is a, a transformative breakthrough and you need to pay attention to what you're doing as you undergo that knowing event. Uh, I have added to this, um, and I don't have time to talk to you about the check mark, but you can read about it in Loving to Know and Little Manual for Knowing. But the, the first horizontal line is you uh, doodling along happily in life. And then what happens is you kind of uh, fall into a situation where you realize there's so, that there's a problem. So uh, the author I get this from um, calls it conflict in context. <laughs> and then you start scrabbling creatively to try to put it together. You lose your credit card and your mind is a whirl trying to figure out the last place you left it. Okay? And then what happens is in the aha moment it's, it's, it's as if a new world breaks in and it's full of possibilities. Which makes me a very happy person. So I think that what we need to do in epistemological therapy is heal our epistemic default, and one way to express it is to say, well, let's, uh, let's change out this word information and put in the word transformation. Nothing wrong with information, but we're talking a philosophical paradigm here, and transformation is a word that might get at it a little bit better. Okay? Did I say there's nothing wrong with having an epistemic default? That's just being human. You're a particular bodied, historied, placed, person, you're sitting in a single chair today, you're not looking behind you, you know, all of that is particular, and of course we're rooted in the world. But the interesting thing about subsidiaries is you can get some of them wrong. There, there's no guarantee of certainties with regard to, to subsidiaries, and you can get some of them right, some of them wrong, and you can be wearing a distorted defective epistemic default that needs epistemological therapy. This is why I talk about it as therapy, because it's almost like your body needs to relearn this. Okay? It's, it's not going to, if, if the knowledge is information mindset is a problem, well, if I stand here and give you more information, how is that going to fix the knowledge is information mindset? Which is why if I can get you walking around and talking to people and, and, you know, doing all of that, that's, that's just kind of torpedoing the daisy. So that's what's going on. And I'll explain the pictures a little bit later. Oh, I guess I better go back. Well, no, I'll stick with this one. Uh, the best oh, I see it moment in the world happens to be in the Bible, and this one's very, very close to the heart of why you love Christ. Um, and that is the road to Emmaus. So, you know, those poor disciples, here comes this young Jewish looking guy walking with them from Jerusalem after this horrific weekend where they've watched the person they thought was their Messiah be crucified. And they, they say to him, isn't it awful what happened? And he says, what happened? <laughs> well, that's a clue <laughs> that there's something strange, especially as he's dressed as a young Jewish man, right? So, so they're talking with Jesus along the way. Well, they're not going to see that he's Jesus because dead men don't rise again, right? But then when are their eyes opened? Their eyes were opened in the breaking of the bread. So they take their eyes off his face and see his hands doing something they would have seen him do again and again and again. And it's that that is the moment of epiphany. And it doesn't just change 
this situation. It changes life and eternity. Praise God. <laughs> so it's, it's just a great moment. So this painting is in London. I did get to see it. Well, I would like to suggest that, I'm, that this subsidiary focal integration is just what's going to torpedo the daisy. And I hope you're starting to see, you know what? I do this all the time. And uh, so I, I, I actually think if you think about bike riding, it actually is going to like dispel the defective epistemic default. Now it's going to take a whole lot of time thinking about this. You're going to have to talk about it with lots of people. There's a lot of you know, processing because we're fighting upstream still on the modernist paradigm. But there is no way you can ride a bike on the knowledge as information mindset. There's no way you can play baseball on the knowledge as information mindset. There's no way you can be an artist on the knowledge as information mindset. You can't do a business on the knowledge as information mindset. So you might as well do this, okay? So now we're going to have a quick conversation. You have uh, no more than five minutes. And when I start yelling, please quiet down. But what I want you to do is have your threesome each identify for each other a skill and make it a, 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 a nice skill. And I'm skipping the other things here. Uh, and when I say a nice skill, uh, pick a skill that you have that you do easily, you do all the time, and uh, it would be great if it involves a, an instrument or tool. Okay? So, because that'll give uh, scope for reflection. So it can be ordinary. I mean, I, bike riding can be bike riding, but you have others too. So just take a few minutes, turn to your partners, and hear each other's skill. What? Netball. Netball. That's basketball, right? Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's basketball in the same way that cricket is baseball. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, John? Uh, swimming. Swimming. Knitting. Knitting. Cooking. Cooking. Painting. Painting. Bouldering, soldering. Soldering. sewing, yeah, soldering. S soldering. Soldering. Yeah. Okay. Jewelry making. Yeah. Singing. Singing. Canoeing. Can oh, that's good. Typing. Typing. Good. All right. So are you tracking? So what I would like is in your three, some pick one of those three of your skills. Uh, um, Actually, you don't even have to do it this way. Just stick with your skill. But what I want you to do is think about your skill as we go through the next slides, right? And then the next time we talk to each other, what we're going to do is identify the different pieces of subsidiary focal integration with respect to our skill. Got it? OK. All right, on we go.